we are very grateful for God's holy Sabbath day of rest. And I am so thankful for the study that the Lord has given to be presented to his people today. Today is truly a thinking study. And I am going to appeal to your minds in a very strong way. Because today we're going to deal with the topic of all topics. This topic that we're studying today is a topic that there has been many movies, many books, many cartoons, lots of different expressions in the religious world and sometimes even the secular world. And this subject is dealing with none other than the mark of the beast. And so as we prepare our hearts to go through this study, a very serious and a very solemn study, once and for all, by the grace of God, we want to make this thing plain. And so as we prepare our hearts to go through this study, let us do as has been our custom, uh, which is to go to our knees. And if you're able to, please kneel with me, and let's approach the Lord in prayer at this time. And I trust that God has wondrous things out of his word to share with each and every one of us. So let us pray together. Father in heaven, we just praise you and thank you for another day of life, health, and strength. We thank you for your holy Sabbath day of rest. And we thank you, Lord, for the privilege to begin to study a very deep, a very serious and solemn study, a study that weighs in the balance our eternal life or our eternal death. And so, Lord, it would be at such a time as this that the devil would distract the minds of your people. And so I'm praying that you would please abide with us, forgive us of our sins, grant us the presence of your Holy Spirit. May he bring every heart and mind at ease. Let no distraction take place. And let nothing deviate us from looking clearly at what your word says and hearing your spirit give the right interpretation. And I thank you that you have heard this prayer, but also that you have answered it. And Lord, I commit myself afresh into your hands. I pray that you'll take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Amen. This is our prayer that we do ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And I can assure you it would be like the enemy to want to make sure that this presentation does not come up, but he is already defeated. Amen? Amen? And so we'll see that as we address this subject, the mark of the beast. The first thing I want to do, and I'll go ahead and give them time to work on that, let's go to Revelation 13. We're going to look at the entire chapter. So I'm going to do verse 1, you'll do verse 2, I'll do verse 3, you'll do verse 4, and we'll take it right down to 18. So that way we can go through that portion and then come back and then see how everything unfolds as it relates to the screen. So Revelation, we're going to chapter 13, and we're going to start at verse 1. I will read verse 1, you read verse 2, and we'll take it onward. Are we all there? Amen. So let's go ahead. Revelation 13, starting at verse 1, the Bible says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horn ten crowns, and upon his head the name of blasphemy. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. If any man have an ear to hear, let him hear. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon.
And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. An entire week or more can be spent on uncoding and presenting every point brought through the book of Revelation 13. But we, of course, do not have the privilege of having such a nice opportunity to go through it piece by piece. So I'm going to always encourage you to study these things out for yourself, make it plain, go through it verse by verse. Literally, don't let even a word pass. I believe Jesus really meant it when he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You'd be amazed at how many words are in Revelation 13 that if you miss it, you can misunderstand the whole chapter. And therefore, I'm going to encourage you to do very careful study. But what we are going to do in this shorter privilege of study is we're going to address a list of a few questions. Number one, we're going to address the question, who is this first beast? Who is this beast that's coming up out of the sea? Then number two, we're going to also address who is the second beast, because there was a second beast that was coming up out of the earth. Then we're going to address the next question, which is, what is the image of the beast? You saw that in verse 14, that the people had to erect something called an image of the beast. We need to define that. Number four, we need to understand what is the seal of God. Now, we're going to address the seal of God, though that was not mentioned in Revelation 13, but you're going to see that the seal of God is in direct contrast to the fifth question, which is, what is the mark of the beast? So that's why we're going to address these five points in our study today, right now. We're going to seek to understand who is the first beast, who is the second beast, what is the image of the beast, what is the seal of God, and then what is the mark of the beast? And I believe the Lord, by his grace, will make these things plain. So let's begin. When we think about who is the first beast, the beast rising up out of the sea, in other words, who is this sea beast that was spoken of in Revelation 13, 1 to 8, and then also verses 16 to 18? One of the key things that we should remember, and for those of us who have been here, especially night after night, as we have been going through Bible prophecy, looking at the book of Daniel, looking at the fourth beast, studying the little horn, you'll remember that we saw seven heads and ten crowns. Did we not see that already? And what did we understand, those seven heads and ten crowns? What was that beast power or that little horn power? What was it? Who remembers? You're sounding like you were not paying attention in class. So I want you to tell me, what did we find out from Scripture made up that little horn power that ultimately became a persecutor to God's people? What was it? The, the papacy. Very good. And then if you don't understand the word or the term papacy, we can even make it more plain. What is an even more plain way of saying it? The Roman Catholic Church system. So this is what was being prophesied about. So when we think about that, remember... The Bible says that it would receive a deadly wound. It would receive a deadly wound, but then it said the wound would be healed. Now, we're going to talk about this. When did Rome receive its deadly wound? We actually gave dates on all of these things. Excellent. It was in 1798. That is when Berthier entered Rome in 1798, exactly as the prophecy predicted. Now, there's going to be some of you here. Let me put this in right now. There are going to be some of you here that are coming for the first time. So you are really, more than likely, unless you have major prophetic studies in your past, you more than likely are not going to understand quite a bit of what I'm going to be sharing because this is as a result of building up a strong foundation. So therefore, if you're coming for the first time, what I'm going to recommend is either the person who invited you or definitely the folks over in the back at the table when you go out the door, go to them and say, could I get some of the study guides that help bring us up to this point? And they will gladly give it to you, so that way things that we're talking about will make a bit more sense. All right, so again, 
it was going to receive a deadly wound. The papacy, the Roman Catholic Church system, did suffer a deadly wound in 1798 when the Pope was taken captive. And of course, the deadly wound was inflicted when Napoleon's general, Alexander Berthier, entered Rome and took Pope Pius VI captive in February of 1798. Napoleon decreed that at the death of the Pope, the papacy would be discontinued. So everything happened right on time, just as the Bible predicted. Continuing, there were 10 characteristics of that sea beast, 10 characteristics that, again, ties it right back into what we call the papacy of the Roman Catholic Church system. What was it, number one? It was a composite of the four beasts of Daniel 7. You remember it said it had uh, feet like a leopard and, and a mouth like a lion and feet like a bear, and it was very much like a leopard. Remember that the succession of beasts in Daniel 7, it was lion, then bear, then leopard, and then the indescript fourth beast, which was Rome. So obviously, going backwards, it's like Daniel was looking into the prophetic future, and John is looking in the prophetic past. Daniel was looking ahead of time. Daniel was in Babylon, but he talks about the bear, Medo-Persia. He talks about the leopard, Greece, and then he talks about the indescript beast, which was Rome. John the Revelator is living in the time of Rome. So now John says this beast power is like the leopard. He has feet like the bear, and he has a mouth like the lion. They're seeing the same thing. It's just that Daniel's looking future, John is looking past. So therefore, this is none other than Rome. The dragon gave it its power and authority. We learned that the dragon is who? The dragon is Satan. Revelation 12, verse 7. The Bible makes it clear that the dragon is Satan. Continuing, it receives a deadly wound. That was in verse 3. The deadly wound would be healed. I am here to submit unto you. The deadly wound is not healed yet. But the wound is going through its healing process. And you'll understand that shortly. Then it says it's how it was a strong political power, but also it was a strong religious power because it was able to rule nations, but it was also able to cause people to worship. So therefore, it was a strong political, but a strong religious power. It was also guilty of blasphemy. We studied in the Bible that blasphemy is when you claim to have power to forgive sins or you claim to be God. John 10 and verse 33, the Bible makes it clear, anyone who claims to be God, that's blasphemy. Matthew 9, 1 through 6, the Bible shows any man who claims to have power to forgive sins, that's blasphemy. Rome claims both. Continuing, it wars with and overcomes the saints of God. That's the 1260 years of papal persecution, better known as the Dark Ages. Then it rules for 42 months, which again, spread out, is 1,260 years, a day in prophecy representing a year. It has a mysterious number, 666. That we're going to break down today. It has a mysterious number called 666. We need to break that down. And then that is none other than the Roman Catholic Church. All of it fits Rome perfectly, even to the point that if you look at the Pope, you remember that when the Popes would walk, and many of the cardinals, they would wear a mitre on their head. It would basically look pretty much like this. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it's the number of a what? You see, I used to watch movies where people would, you know, there'd be a boy. His name was Damien, and he'd be sleeping in his bed. And all of a sudden, somebody would go to Damien and start looking all through his head. And when they start looking at his head, they would see, oh, 666 is written on his head. He's the beast. And this is what a lot of people believe today. And that's why when people want to find the mark of the beast, they're going around searching in people's heads. They're looking forward to see some type of numerical calculation in their head. But that is not what the Bible says. The Bible says it's the number of a what? It's the number of a man. It's the number of a man. So when you look at 666, we're not looking for a branding that's going to be on somebody's head. But it's a number that describes a man. Now, considering that, you would be amazed to notice that when the popes would wear their tiara or mitre, which is that right there, often they would have written on it something that says, Vicarious Filii Dei. Vicarious Filii Dei. Now, you ever heard of Roman numerals? Remember in school we used to learn Roman numerals? Okay, when you look at these words, it's very interesting because vicarious, vicarious Filii Dei 
means biker of Christ, equal to Christ. That, my brothers and sisters, is blasphemy. Because when Jesus was on this earth, he was God in the flesh. You understand that? God in the flesh. All right? They shall call his name Jesus. He shall save his people from their sins. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When a human being tries to equate himself to Christ, that is blasphemy. But on the Pope's mitre or tiara, you will see vicarious filii dei. And again, equal to Christ, that which is equal to the Son of God, vicar of Christ. If you look up the term vicarious, literally the, new, the numbers add up to 112. Filii adds up to 53. Dei adds to 501. When you take 112 plus 53 plus 501, it adds up to 666. It's the number of a man. Now, if you carefully look at our past president, Ronald Reagan, if you take his, his name and also connect it with Roman numerical calculation, it will also add up to 666. This is one of the reasons why when there was an attempt on his assassinate, when somebody attempted to kill him many years ago, and they shot him, and he took a shot in the head, and they said they were trying to kill the beast, and then when he did not die and his wound was healed, there were many fanatical Christians who were actually teaching that the beast's wound was healed, and they were connecting it to Revelation 13. But that's why you would never use a singular event to understand Bible prophecy. You have to take it with its package. In other words, all we have to do is say, did Ronald Reagan rule for 1,260 years? Well, we already know the answer to that. So there, you understand? So that's the way we can rule out Ronald Reagan or any other person's name, because people will do that. People will take a name and say, hey, Dwayne Everett Lemon adds up to 666, which it doesn't. <laughs> but people will do that to try to substantiate a point. But again, it connects because is the Pope directly connected to the Roman Catholic system? Absolutely. So therefore, it fits the entire package. Do you understand that? All right. So now continuing, who is the land beast? The sea beast is dealing with none other than the papacy. No question about that. Who is that land beast? Who is this beast in verse 11 that was coming up out of the earth? Who is this beast? So let's go ahead and let's take a look at that. There is something very special about that beast in Revelation 13. Go back there with me very quickly. I just want to make sure you catch it, Revelation 13, because it's very important that you catch this point so that way, you know, hopefully everything will come together. Revelation 13, take a look at it again. The Bible says in Revelation 13, remember, before verse 11, it was dealing with the first beast, the sea beast, okay? In Revelation 13, it was dealing with the sea beast, which is who? The, come on class, this is way too early to start going to sleep. Who makes up that sea beast? The papacy. The papacy. You understand that? The papacy. Now, up until verse 11, it's talking about that papacy power. So what does it say in verse 10? It says in verse 10, he that leadeth into captivity. Did the papacy do that? Did the papacy lead people into captivity? If you believed opposite of the Roman Catholic Church, were you punished? Were you put on a stake and burnt alive? Were people buried alive? You understand that? So literally, those who believed in Jesus and his truth and refused to follow papal dogma, they were led into captivity. But what does the prophecy say? It says, he that leadeth into captivity shall what? Go into captivity. See that? And he that killeth with the sword must be what? Killed with the sword. So the Bible was making it clear that that first beast power, though it led others into captivity, it was eventually going to be led into captivity. And when did the papacy go into captivity? What year? 1798. Now, verse 11, watch it. It says right there in verse 11, it says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. Right around the time of the captivity of the pope and the demise of the papacy there was already a beast what did we learn a beast represents a kingdom there was already a kingdom that was gradually growing coming up out of the earth so when we think about that let's consider the points it comes up out of the earth it happens right around the time of the time of the end 
which is that 1798 time period. He has two horns that are lamb-like, and there's a connection between it and the first beast, and it is governed by a democratic process. How do we know that it's governed by a democratic process? What did it say in verse 14? Look at it again in Revelation 13 and verse 14. It said in verse 14, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast. So the way that this power works is it does not dictate. It does not say what it wants. What it does is it reasons and coerces the people on the earth to, ask, to encourage them to ask or beg, or command, or plead for what they want, and then the powers up top gives them what they want. You follow that? So therefore, it's not a power that just says, it is what it is, like it or love it, I am the king. This is a power that gives power to the people. You understand that? Saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast. Now, continuing, let's go ahead and watch this point. Flowers. When you look at the term coming up out of the earth, it literally in the Greek speaks to the same way that a flower grows. A flower does not go seed and then it just pops up. Is that right? The way that a flower grows, for the earth bringeth forth, um, excuse me, for the earth bringeth forth fruit of itself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. That's how plants grow when it grows out of the earth. So it was with this nation. It was not just going to suddenly, boom, just pop up in the scene and become this incredible power. This nation had to first grow just like a plant, coming up out of the earth, gradually, gradually, gradually. So when it says coming up out of the earth, it is signifying it is growing just as plants would grow out of the earth. What is this nation that was growing right around the time of the late 1700s that also was going to follow all these other patterns that we're mentioning? Number one. Which nation was predicted to arise around the same time the papacy was receiving its deadly wound? The Bible says, Revelation 13, 11, the beast was coming up out of the earth. The papal captivity mentioned in verse 10 took place in 1798, and the new power was seen emerging at that time. Who constitutes this new power? The United States declared its independence in 1776, voted the Constitution in 1787, adopted the Bill of Rights in 1791, and was clearly recognized as a world power by 1798. The timing obviously fits America. There's literally no other kingdom that fits it. Any historian in this room, you know, if you're a historian, there's no other kingdom that rose up on the scene that fits the composite picture of what we see with this beast outside of the United States of America. And as powerful as the United States of America is, do we honestly think that it would not be mentioned in Bible prophecy? Now remember, not only does the United States fit just from its historical upbringing, but also its behaviors. You remember that the horns were lamb-like. Is that lamb that's being referred to, is that literal lamb or symbolic lamb? It's symbolic. It's symbolic. Revelation is speaking in symbols. Who do we know constitutes the symbolic lamb? John 1 and verse 29. The Bible says, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. The lamb refers to Christ himself. So then the question is, what do horns represent? Horns in the Bible can represent powers. Horn can represent power in the Bible. Here's your proof. If you look at the book of Habakkuk, notice what it says. In Habakkuk 3 and verse 4, it says, And his brightness was as the light. He had horns coming out his hand, and there was the hiding of his what? Power. So horns can represent power power in the Bible. So when this nation, this beast was rising up out of the earth, it had two horns that were lamb-like. Those two powers, what were the two powers that literally governed the United States of America that's in full harmony with the Bible and Jesus and his truth? What were the two powers that govern our blessed country, the United States of America, in its inception? Does anybody know? It's very simple. You know what it was? It's right here. 
Republicanism and also something called Protestantism. That is how America got started. What is Republicanism? It's a government without an earthly king. That's biblical. In 1 Samuel 8 and verse 5, you remember the children of Israel said, Oh, Lord, we want a king so we can be like the other nations. And God says, you don't need to be like the other nations. God says, I am your king. And later on, they insisted, no, Lord, we want to be like the other nations. So when you get to 1 Samuel 12 and verse 19, notice what the children of Israel said. Go there. Look at 1 Samuel 12. They begged and they pleaded with God, oh, Lord, give us a king. Give us a king, Lord, please, please, please. And as they begged and pleaded, God says, I'm going to give you what you asked for, but you watch what you get because of what you asked for. And now watch what the Bible says in 1 Samuel 12, and notice what it says in verse 19. What was the conclusion of the children of Israel's thought processes once they got what they wanted so bad? The Bible says in 1 Samuel 12, notice what it says in verse 19, and notice what the Bible says. The Bible says, and all the people, how many of the people? It says, and all the people said unto Samuel, pray for thy servants unto the Lord thy God, that we die not, for we have added unto all our what? All our sins, this evil in doing what? Asking for a king. You see that? My brothers and sisters, God was always Israel's king. But Israel wanted to be like the other churches around them. Israel wanted to be like the other nations. And they were getting tired of God's economy, tired of God's program, and they thought that they would have better prosperity being like everybody else. My brothers and sisters, never strive to be like everybody else. Always strive to be like Jesus. The Bible says that they tried to go ahead and get a king, and when they did it, curses fell upon Israel. And you study the history. You go through First and Second Samuel. You go through First and Second Kings. Go through First and Second Chronicles, my brothers and sisters. And you will see they never needed a king. All they needed was God. The principle of republicanism when America was started is that we will be a government, but we will have no earthly king over us telling us what to do. The power was to lie with the people. That was how America got started. But then Protestantism, oh my, that was a beautiful, beautiful horn that was also upon America in its inception. What is Protestantism? A church without a pope. My brothers and sisters, we need to learn our history. Some of the greatest atrocities in the name of Christianity has happened as a result of dogmatic popes. Many of the reformers, many individuals would suffer death in some of the most cruel ways. Up to 50 million Christians would be slaughtered, my brothers and sisters, because of a command from a pope. That would say, if they don't believe how we believe, then it's better that they cease to exist. And it's written all over the pages of history. You don't need a Bible to understand this. You can go right to your Encyclopedia of Britannica. You can go to any historical book, and you will see the works of the papacy during those dark ages. And so it is that a principle of Protestantism was that we are a church without a pope. Every man follows God according to their own conviction. That was what the Bible gave. In other words, religious liberty. This is literally how America got started. Truly, it had two horns like a lamb. It believed in republicanism, a government without a king. It believed in Protestantism, a church without a pope. No man tells us what to do. Why? Because the Bible says in John 4, 24, they that worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 3, 17, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. That's what America got started as. And my brothers and sisters, I'm here to tell you America is a very different place today. And I fear for the presidential elects that are coming up and the stuff that they're talking. My brothers and sisters, you and I need to understand, you better hold tight to your religious liberty because it's soon on its way out. If these people have their way with the things that they are saying, the children of God need to be on their knees praying because let me tell you something, we are not hearing from many of these so-called presidential elects, we are not hearing the foundational, fundamental teachings that was given to America. 
we're hearing something that is contradicting it. And we are hearing something that's endangering our freedoms. Once we see our Muslim brothers get punished, it won't be long before certain Christian sects will be punished. Pay attention to the writing on the wall, my brothers and sisters. It's right in front of us. And so it is that God was showing that that is that second beast. It was none other than the United States of America. No question about it. And so when we think of who is that first beast, it is none other than the papacy. When we think of who is that second beast, it is none other than the United States of America. Now let's go to our next question. Let's consider it. What is the image of the beast? Man, Daniel. Daniel 2, one day Daniel gets this vision, right? And you remember King Nebuchadnezzar gets the dream first, and then he couldn't understand it. He's ready to kill these, these, these magicians because they couldn't answer his questions. So Daniel says, all right, give me a minute. I'll, I'll go to God. I can't answer it, but there's a God in heaven who can. He goes to God, and God helps Daniel understand the vision. And God begins to relay through Daniel. He relays to Nebuchadnezzar what took place. Now watch this. An image of the beast. Number one, the word image. If we understand the word image, it means representation or resemblance of something. All right? So when you think of an image, it is that which represents or is a resemblance of something else. In this case, it's a resemblance of the beast. All right? It's a resemblance of the beast. So the more you understand the beast, the easier it is to understand its image. Now watch this. Daniel gets this dream. This has been seen by millions of people all over the world. And that head of gold represented the kingdom of Babylon. The arms and breast of silver represented Medo-Persia. Belly and thigh of brass represented Greece. And the legs of iron represented Rome. But confusion usually comes on the feet. I've gone many places, literally all over the world, and I have asked, what does the head of gold? And the congregations will say, Babylon. You say, what is the arms and breasts of silver? Medo-Persia. What's the belly and thigh of brass? Greece. What's the legs of iron? Rome. What's the feet of iron and clay? And all of a sudden, people don't have a clear answer. What do the feet of iron and clay represent? So let's consider it. Here's one thing we do know. The feet of iron and clay exist until a certain experience. What happens after the feet of iron and clay? There's this stone that is cut out without hands, and the stone comes down, hits the uh, image at the feet, crushes the feet, legs, belly, thigh, brass, arms, everything, head, everything. Everything gets destroyed. And then another kingdom is set up, which is an eternal kingdom. We believe this stone is to represent the kingdom of Christ, because that's the only kingdom that lasts forever. Now watch this. That means that the feet of iron and clay exist until the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, that means it cannot, listen to my words carefully, I know what I'm saying. I need you to make sure you hear what I'm saying. That means the feet of iron and clay cannot be, here's the word, limited to the ten divided nations of Western Europe. Can't be limited to that. Because certain prophetic teachers will simply tell you the ten toes of the feet represents the ten divided nations of Western Europe. But wait a minute, three of them were uprooted. So that's not ten anymore, it's seven. So therefore, there has to be a broader principle of the feet of iron and clay. So you want to know what I believe the feet of iron and clay represent? You want to know what I believe it represents? I believe it represents the combining of church and state. That's what I believe. Now somebody says, that's nice that you believe that. Now prove it. No problem. So watch this. What do the feet of iron and clay represent? Why don't we zoom in on the feet? When we zoom in on the feet of iron and clay, very simple question. When you have the legs of iron, what do the legs of iron represent? Rome. No question about that. You can get a historical book, keep your Bible closed, and you can see Rome is the fourth power. Now watch this. Legs rep the legs of iron represented Rome. So is there iron in the feet? So what do you think the iron still represents? still represents Rome. Now watch this. When you zoom in on the iron, Rome was a political or civil power. That's what Rome was. At the end of the day, that's what Rome was. It was a political or civil power. It ruled all nations. Clay, however, clay is a new element. You don't have clay anywhere else on that body of that image. So the clay is the new element. So the question is, according to the Bible, what does clay represent? So let's notice that. Clay, if we zoom in on the clay, you know what clay represents? God's people or church. 
That's what clay represents. How do we know? Go to Jeremiah 18. Let's turn there. So when you go to Jeremiah 18, what does clay represent in symbolism? Notice what the Bible says. Jeremiah, we're looking at chapter 18. In Jeremiah, the 18th chapter, notice what the Bible says, verses 4 to 6. Because remember, the feet of iron and clay exist right until the second coming of Jesus Christ. That is very important for us to understand because we're going over the image of the beast. So the Bible says in Jeremiah 18, starting at verse 4, if you're there, please say amen. amen. The Bible says, and the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. Did you see that? So what did God liken the clay to? The house of Israel. He likened it to his people. Isaiah 64, second witness. Go back, another book. Let's go to Isaiah 64, second witness. In Isaiah 64, notice what the Bible says in verse 8. In Isaiah, the 64th chapter and the 8th verse, notice what the Bible says again. Isaiah 64 and verse 8. It says, but now, O Lord, thou art our father, we are the what? We are the clay. We are the clay, and thou art potter, and we all are the work of thy hand. God's people was representing the clay. So therefore, when we see a feat of iron and clay, we are seeing a mingling of civil and religious power. Now watch how the Bible brings it out again. You read it, but now consider it. Go back to Revelation 13. Watch it again. Look at Revelation 13, but now consider it. Sometimes we read, but we don't consider. Let's consider it. Revelation 13. Go back there. Now watch what the Bible says here. Revelation, we're back in chapter 13 now, and now watch verse 7 again. In Revelation 13 and verse 7, watch the text. It's ever so clear. It's not just in the old, it's in the new. In Revelation 13, notice what the Bible says in verse 7. If you're there, please say amen. amen. The Bible says, and it was given unto him to make war with the saints. This is dealing with the beast power, the papacy. It says, and it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And what was given them? Power or authority. Now notice what the papacy had authority or power over. It says, and power or authority was given him over how much? All kindreds and tongues and? If you have all power over nations, what kind of power is that called? That's civil power. That is civil power. When you can tell a nation what to do, how to run, and how to govern, that is called civil power. But it doesn't stop there. Verse 8. What did it say in verse 8? It says, and all that dwell upon the earth shall do what else? Worship him. When you can force people to worship you, what kind of power is that? That's religious power. So even the beast power, think about it. We're studying the image of the beast. And the beast, it exercised power over all people. And the power it exercised was a union of religious and civil power. Do you see it, my brothers and sisters? It's in the Bible. So it is not limited to just the ten divided kingdoms of Western Europe. No, my brothers and sisters, that's what we call light answers. Those, those are surface answers. But what was the ten divided kingdoms of Western Europe? It was a union of civil and religious power. And even when they dumbed down to only seven, that principle still exists until the end of time. And so it is that that's what God is showing us, that in the last days, we're going to see in America a reunion of church and state. That means that when you watch the news, you got to look at it a little bit more carefully. You got to listen to the arguments more carefully. You got to watch what the people are saying more carefully. Because what we don't see is something's happening under the rug. We're getting caught up in a lot of the fluffy stuff, but we're not paying attention to the argument. We're not listening to what they're saying. And what we see is that there's a lot of religious things that are being switched around and changed. There's a lot of freedoms nationally that are being switched around and changed, and there's a lot of people that are getting mad about it, and they're fighting back. And they want their religion and the state to come together. 
My brothers and sisters, the Bible prophesies that this is exactly what was going to happen. And church and state was not something brand new. It was something old with the papacy. This man right here, he is one of the you know, icons, if you will, in Roman Catholicism. His name is Constantine. And when the church wanted to get rid of these annoying Christians, they would try everything. They would kill them, but Christian blood is the best fertilizer on planet Earth, in case you haven't known that. Because every time you kill one, ten more pop up. So Rome began to understand, listen, if you can't beat them, let's join them. And so it is the national leader at the time, Constantine, what he decided was, I'm going to also become a religious leader. And he put out a very interesting decree showing, again, the union of church and state. And here's what he did. He put out this decree which says, let all the judges, this is, this is, this is a statement that clearly demonstrates the union of church and state. It says, let all the judges and townspeople and the occupation of all trades rest on the venerable day of the sun. Remember, Rome before it became Christian was pagan, and pagans always go back in worshiping the sun. The sun is considered the chief god of the constellations. So therefore, sun worship was huge in Rome. So they did not stop that. What they did was just switch things around. So they said, the venerable day of the sun, Sunday, that's going to be the day that they're going to do something special. So here's what Constantine said. Let all the judges and townspeople and the occupation of all trades rest on the venerable day of the sun. It's called a Sunday law. Sunday law. They put out a law. Why could they put out a law and tell people you have to rest and stop working? How is it that they can tell judges and townspeople to stop working, even if they're not religious? It was because of the union of church and state. So it says, let them all rest on the day of the, the venerable day of the sun. But then there were certain people, which I thought was very interesting, there were certain people that was not as subject to this Sunday law. It says, but let those who are situated where? In the country. Well, that's interesting. It says, let those who are situated in the country freely and at full liberty attend to the business of agriculture. In other words, all you city folks, you're going to have to follow what we say according to our Sunday law. But those in the country, you don't have to worry about that. Continue growing your food and doing what you have to do. Very interesting historical statement. Nevertheless, it says, because it often happens that no other day is so fit for sowing corn and planting vines, lest the critical moment let slip and men should lose the commodities granted by heaven. This was put together by Constantine, a union of church and state. And so when I go back to Revelation 13, go back there now. Watch what the text said next. This one I want you to look at in verse 12. Watch what the Bible says. Very, very powerful. In Revelation 13, verse 12, there was something about this beast power. Look at what it says here. Because there was a union of church and state with the first beast, but there must be a union of church and state with the second beast, which is America. How do we know that? Verse 12. Look at what it says in Revelation 13 and verse 12. It says, and he exercises how much of the power? Now, did the first beast have power to tell nations and people what to do on both civil and religious terms. So the second beast exercises how much power? All power. In order for it to exercise all the power of the first beast, that means it must have what the first beast had. Make sense? Has to be. So if the first beast had a union of civil religious power, then this second beast is going to have a union of civil and religious power. So let's finish the verse. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. That means that there is a special relationship between the second and the first beast. There's a special relationship because it says that the second beast is going to cause, force people to worship the first beast. Would America ever get to a place that it would become so friendly with Rome that it would begin to take Rome's counsels, follow their suggestions, their commands even, pay homage to the Holy Father and others so that what the papacy wants, America becomes the instrument to get it done. Could that happen? Is that happening? 
But the question is when. You see, America was not always a superpower until a certain time. You remember that there was a time when Russia became a tremendous threat to the United States of America. Because if, for, for America to exercise all power, it has to be more powerful than any other nation to exercise all power. That's just sensible. So therefore, the question is, when did America become all powerful? And it happened many years ago. You know when it happened? It happened right here. You remember in Russia, the Soviet Union, the wall, that there was a major issue, and Russia became a serious threat to, Ro to America. But then that happened, the Holy Alliance. I thought it was interesting that Time Magazine entitled it a Holy Alliance. It marked history for the students of prophecy. And in this Holy Alliance, who are the two people you see there? Ronald Reagan on the left, John Paul II on the right. And look at what it says. It says how Reagan and the Pope conspired to assist Poland's solidarity movement and hasten the demise of communism. When they came together, you remember that America became a world superpower. And this was 1989. It was since 1989 that America became an official world superpower. And to date, America still is the world superpower. People can say what they want. They can threaten what they want. North Korea, Kim Jong-un, and everybody else can say, we have nuclear weapons. America is not afraid of anybody. America reasons, but America knows how to speak like a dragon if it has to. And so it is that when you look at this, remember the letter that was written to uh, Gorbachev? General Secretary Gorbachev, if you seek peace, if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, if you seek liberalization, come here to this gate, exclamation point. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. That doesn't sound like a suggestion. That doesn't sound like a request. That sounds very much like a command. It was in November of 1989 that the Berlin Wall was torn down. The Cold War was officially declared over at a Malta summit on December 3, 1989, and two years later, the Soviet Union collapsed. And from that time, America became and is the world superpower. America is in position to be the second beast of Revelation 13. It's in position, but what it needs is it needs your vote and it needs your cooperation. And this is why I can guarantee you the devil is very upset with the studies we are doing today and have been doing. Now watch this. There's going to be a union of church and state once again, and there are plenty of agitations that are causing church and state relations to constantly come up. You remember that we had in 2001 the Patriot Act. You had also in 2002 Homeland Security Act. You obviously had in 2012, there was the issue with the precious children that were killed in the uh, school in Connecticut, and hence we started seeing the gun law issue, and that's still an issue to date, where there's constantly a going after the Second Amendment, and it's causing a resistance. And then, of course, some of the most recent ones in 2014, the relig religious liberty over gay marriage issues. All of these things are agitations, and church and state discussions have never been more popular. At what point does the government have a right to say what we do and not do, et cetera? These things are hot topics right now. That's what you pay attention to, not what celebrity is naming their baby. What a celebrity names their baby has nothing to do with your future or your mental, physical, spiritual development, my brothers and sisters. But these things that's happening on the news has everything to do with it. And so we need to understand what's going on in our times so that we know exactly what to do. So let's review. Number one, who is the sea beast? Come on, class, talk like you know what you believe. What is or who is the sea beast? It's the papacy. Number two, who is the land beast? United States of America. Number three, what is the image of the beast? The, the union of church and state, civil religious liberties, civil and religious union coming together. That is what the image of the beast is. So now we're almost done, because now we need to understand what is the seal of God. To understand the mark of the beast, we must first understand God's sign, seal, or mark. We have to understand that. So here's the first thing that I did. What I did was I took each of these terms, sign, seal, and mark. I took it from the Old Testament, and I took it from the New Testament to just show what they mean. So let's go over that. What is a seal, mark, or a sign, according to Scripture? First, I went just to the original language on it, right? And when I go to the original language, when I think of sign, seal, and mark in Hebrew, you got kothem, you have of, and then you have of or of again. Now, look at it. In the Hebrew, sign, seal, mark. 
Seal can be a mark. A sign can be a mark. A mark can be a sign. In other words, they're all interchangeable. They're interchangeable. It's important you understand that. So when you see mark, if you see seal, or if you see sign, they're all basically saying the same thing. Now, I want you to get that, okay? Now, same thing with the Greek. Sign, seal, and mark in Greek. Notice, same thing. Seal, you got sphregis, uh, simeon, and karagma. Now, notice, again, seal, mark, sign, token. I like that. Then it says, mark, stamp. So again, when you're looking at sign, seal, mark, even in the Greek, it's basically synonymous, talking about the same thing. So just because you read one verse and it says mark, you read another verse and it says sign, still talking about the same thing. Follow that? Still talking about the same thing. So please do not get tripped up when you see one area say mark, another area say seal, another area say sign. So now let's continue. I started studying the Bible carefully. One of the things they teach you in theology or theological uh, realms is something called the law of first mentions. You look for the first time that the Bible mentions these things. So what I did was I looked at God's first mark. God's first mark in all of the Bible. And it fell upon a man named Cain. And what was interesting about Cain is that Cain did evil. He did very wrong. He killed his brother. But you remember that the Bible makes it clear that God is the one that gives life and God is the one that takes life. And that's obviously why Cain sinned. He took a position of prerogative of God into his own hands, and he killed his own brother. Now, Cain knew, as a result of killing my brother, a lot of people are going to come after me, and I'm going to live like a vagabond, and people are going to come to kill me. So God made a promise to Cain, and I want you to look at what the Bible says. In Genesis 4.15, it says, And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. God made it clear, don't touch him. And then God did this. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. So the first lesson we learn about God's mark that fell on Cain is that the mark was a mark of protection. Don't lose that. The first, in, the first time you ever see in the Bible God putting a mark on someone, the purpose of the mark was for a protection. Do you get that? Very good. Now, the second time. This is the second time you see God mark somebody. But this one's different. This one is based on a whole different principle because it's deeper than just protection. This mark fell upon not only the Christian, but the Jews and the Muslim's father, Abraham. And this is what the Bible says. Genesis 17, 11, And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a what? Token. token. Did we see that the word token can be translated mark, seal, or sign? Yes. And it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. In other words, circumcision was a sign that God gave to Abraham. What was the purpose of this sign? Notice what the Bible says in Romans 4. It says in Romans 4, and he received the what? The sign of circumcision, and then it's referred to as a what? A seal of righteousness of the faith which he had, yet being uncircumcised. Though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. So notice that Abraham received righteousness by faith. And then God says, very good, now here's your sign that you are one of my children that have received my righteousness by faith. And that sign was circumcision. So what do we learn from that one? God's sign is a sign of a covenant made between him and his people. Very important. So God's sign is not only a protection, but it is a symbol of a covenant that he has made with his people. God's last mark. The last time God marks somebody in the Bible, the last time God seals somebody in the Bible, is here. Revelation 7.3 says, Hurt not the earth, neither the trees nor the sea, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So, what is obviously the purpose of this? God's seal is a seal of protection to those who serve him. So if we take all the evidences of Scripture, what God is showing is that his seal is something that he places upon those that he has made a covenant with and they have entered into his covenant. 
And as a result of being sealed or marked, it provides protection when problems start to arise. In this case, when the earth starts to be hurt and the seas and the winds start blowing, those who are marked will not be hurt because they represent the people of the covenant. It's pretty awesome. It's pretty awesome. God says that I'm going to put a mark and a sign and a seal on all of those who have kept my covenant, who have received my righteousness, which is by faith, and who choose to serve me and to love me. God says when all the winds break loose throughout the world and all the strife and the warfare begins, God says there will be a people that I will mark. You see, the Bible tells us something in the book of Ezekiel chapter 9. And the Bible says in Ezekiel 9, And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And to the others he said in mine hearing, Go ye after him through the city and do what? Smite, destroy It says, smite, let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women. That's a serious destruction. God says, spare no one. But how does it close? But come not near any man upon whom is the mark. God says, don't touch anybody that has the mark. You see, a day is going to come where all sinners are going to receive their just wages. The wages of sin is death, my brothers and sisters. And a day is going to come where all sinners are going to receive their just wages. And God says, but there will be those whom I will place my mark upon them. And when the destroying angel goes through, you remember in Israel, in Egypt, that when the angel of death would come, whenever they saw the mark above the door, they didn't touch those people. But everybody who didn't have it, those were the ones. So truly, God's mark, seal, sign is a means of protection amongst those who have obeyed him and who has served him and who have been people of his covenant. So when we think about that, what is it that God wants to mark or seal us with? The Bible says it very clearly. The Bible says in Isaiah 8 and 16, bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. So connected with God's seal is his law. So those who are keeping and following God's law are the people that are clearly demonstrating that they are the people of the covenant. And God says, when the winds begin to blow, and when the destroying angel begins to do his work, God says, during that sealing time, God says, though the earth and the sea and the trees will be hurt, he says, not my sealed ones. God says, I'm going to seal them, I'm going to mark them, I'm going to place my sign upon them. And this is not some sign that we can do. This is a sign that only God can do. Now, my brothers and sisters, bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. And then the question is, where specifically do we find the seal of God in his law? And notice what the Bible says. Moreover, also I gave them my what? I gave them my what? I gave them my Sabbaths to be a what? Sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctifies them. So God didn't just say, just seal the law among my disciples. God knew that there was his actual seal within the law that he impresses upon the disciples. And that seal was none other than his Sabbath. Second witness. The Bible also says right there in Exodus 31, Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual what? Covenant. It says it is a sign between me and the children of Israel for how long? Forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. My brothers and sisters, that seal of God is right there revealed in his holy Sabbath commandment. You see, for some people, it's just a day. But to the true understanding of the Christian, we understand that true Sabbath keeping signifies that a person has surrendered his life to Jesus Christ. 
and is willing to follow wherever Jesus leads. You see, right now we're living in a time where the world says keep Sunday and God says keep Sabbath, and the question is, whose servant are you? And the Bible makes it clear, know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey? It says, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. You see, when I choose to keep God's Sabbath rather than follow the world and its commands, I testify that I'm a child of the Most High God. I'm not seeking to follow man's commandments and man's traditions. I am following God and his commandments. To whomsoever you yield yourself, servants obey. That's whose servant you are, my brothers and sisters. And it doesn't matter. It can be unto sin unto death or it can be of obedience unto righteousness. You and I have to make that choice. So the seal of God is God's holy Sabbath day. That's what God has put within his law, that he wants it to rest upon his people, that they might be identified and protected as his people of the covenant. In the last moments of earth's history. And so it is. Who seals us? Who is it that seals us? Notice, the Bible says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. There are people who say the Holy Spirit is the seal. I respectfully disagree. My Bible says the Spirit of God is the one who seals us, but he's not the seal. He's the one who seals us, but he's not the seal. Are you following? And so therefore, the Bible says, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed. The Spirit of God is the one who seals you. Unto the day of redemption. Now, my next question is, how does he seal us? You think that's a logical question? I think so. So let's find out. How does he seal us? Notice what the Bible says. And I will put my spirit within you. And what happens when the spirit of God is within us? It says, and cause you to walk in my statutes, which is commandments and laws, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. God says, I'm going to put my spirit within you. And then he's going to be the one to empower you to keep God's commandments. That's deep. That's so sweet. The spirit of God is the one that seals us because he's the one that empowers us to keep God's seal. You think you can be holy naturally? Have you tried? My brothers and sisters, the Bible says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. But you and I are very unholy people. I can't keep nothing holy, except it be Christ in me, the hope of glory. And so I need his spirit that I can truly keep his commandments and reveal and have the seal of the living God. That's why the Bible goes on to say, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. So when you think of the seal of God, the seal of God is God's holy Sabbath day. The Spirit of God is the one who seals us and writes God's law in our hearts and gives us power to obey him, that we might testify to the world that he is the God of heaven and earth that sanctifies me. What a wonderful testimony. So our final question, what is then the mark of the beast? You see, my brothers and sisters, the mark of the beast is in direct contrast to God's seal. But that's not enough because remember Daniel 7? Go to Daniel 7 and verse 25. We're almost done. Probably 10 more minutes and we'll be done. Daniel 7. Notice what it says in verse 25. In Daniel the seventh chapter, what is this mark of the beast then? Daniel 7. And now we're looking at verse 25. Here goes our final points, my brothers and sisters. Pay close attention because I know that this is the one everybody's been waiting for. What's the mark of the beast, bro? Thanks for all that other extra information. What's the mark of the beast? All right, let's get to it. The Bible says in Daniel 7 and verse 25, the Bible says, and he shall speak great words. Talking about that beast power, that little horn power. He shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to do something. What's it going to think to do? It's going to think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hands for times, times, dividing of time. He's going to think to change God's law. Now, my brothers and sisters, the reason why this is important for us is because we know that Rome is that little horn power. But the Bible prophesies that what the little horn power is going to do is try to change God's law. Try to change it. Think to change. 
God's law cannot change, but they're going to think to change it. And then I was studying um, Ezekiel 8, and I'm going to show you something here. We know that the Bible has ten commandments. What Rome has done is they basically took out the second commandment. That was their attempt to change God's law in one way. Because the second commandment says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. Do not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. So Rome took that one out because anyone who is a faithful Roman Catholic knows that when you go to church, you are going to bow before images. Sometimes you're going to kiss the feet of the images. Sometimes you're going to pray to those images. And it is strongly encouraged in the Roman Catholic church system. It's encouraged. So therefore, they had to remove that second commandment because there, quite honestly, was no way around it. There was just no way around it. So they thought to change that. But you know what's deep? If God's people paid a careful attention to Ezekiel 20, you would see that idolatry would not exist if God's people were keeping the Sabbath. Go to the book of Ezekiel 20. Watch this. In Ezekiel, the 20th chapter, watch what the Bible says, because we're about to see some startling things right here. Ezekiel 20, and we're going to consider verses 12 to 20. And I want you to see what the Bible says. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. The Bible says in Ezekiel 12, 20, rather, verse 12, it says, Moreover also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctifies them. But the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They walked not in my statutes, and they despised my judgments, which if a man do, he shall even live in them. And my Sabbaths they greatly polluted. Then I said I would pour out my fury upon them in, in the wilderness to consume them. But I wrought for my name's sake that it should not be polluted before the heathen in whose sight I brought them out. Yet also I lifted up my hand unto them in the wilderness that I would not bring them into the land which I had given them, flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all lands. Because they despised my judgments, walked not in my statutes, but polluted my Sabbath, for their heart went after their what? So notice, as a result of polluting the Sabbath, where did their hearts go? To the idols. So notice that. As a result of pollution of Sabbath, it was emboldening to follow idols. You get that? Now watch this. Going on. It says, Nevertheless, mine eye spared from destroying them, neither did I make an end of them in the wilderness. But I said unto their children in the wilderness, Walk ye not in the statutes of your fathers, neither observe their judgments, nor defile yourselves with idols. I am the Lord your God, walk in my statutes, keep my judgments and do them, verse 20, and hollow my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me and you that you may know that I am the Lord your God. The Sabbath was literally designed to protect them from idolatry. So when we look at Rome and we see that in the papacy and so many of the other churches today that a lot of people are now violating God's Sabbath, it is preparatory to actually bowing down and following idols and images. Amen. My brothers and sisters, I began to study Ezekiel 8. You see, you looked at Ezekiel 9 when the seal was placed on all of those who were sighing and crying, right? Do you know that Ezekiel 8 was the last, reveals the last apostasy of God's people, the people who are professing to know God and love God. The last thing that God's people were doing before the angel had to go and start doing his destructive work and the people received the seal. You know what it was? In Ezekiel 8, and he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord. So the people turned their backs on God. Because remember, God's presence would be in the temple. This is the last abomination before the destruction of which the people with the seal had no hurt. The last abomination in the Bible that came amongst those who professed to know and love God. Look at what it says. It says they turned their backs toward the temple of the Lord. They would no longer acknowledge the true and living God. But what did they do in contrast? It says, and their faces toward the east, and they worshiped the sun. They got caught up in sun worship. You know what's deep about that? What the problem that my heart goes out to my Christian brothers and sisters. We, you, I, I, there was a time, I'll say we, because there was a time I was there too. We go to church on Sunday purely based on paganism. Purely. Rome worshiped the sun on Sunday. That's why Constantine made that law that everybody must rest on the venerable day of the sun. Did you see that? 
When Constantine changed everything around, all he did was he joined Christianity and changed pagan practices and started to do what's called baptized paganism. They would worship Jupiter, and they stopped calling it Jupiter. They now called it Peter. They would worship Isis. They would stop worshiping Isis. They now called Isis Mary. They used to worship Tammuz, who was born December 25th. They took Tammuz out of the way and said, now it's Jesus Christ. They brought pagan practices into Christianity. And one of the things that they brought in was to continue paying homage to the sun. They brought in worship, not on God's Sabbath, but on Sunday. And that is literally the origin of Sunday observance. And all they did was they tried to put a little Christianity on top of it. And we, because you, you saw the quotes, my brothers and sisters. I showed you how Baptists, Methodists, Pentecostals, uh, you know, Anglicans, I showed you how all these denominations are like, yep, the seventh-day Sabbath is true. They admit it. So why do you go to church on Sunday? Oh, it's what our fathers did. My brothers and sisters, some of us have been deceived. But it goes deeper than that. You see, the last abomination was that the people would start worshiping the sun. They would start getting involved in pagan practice. They would begin to observe Sunday and watch how it connects. The Catholic Encyclopedia, volume 4, page 153. Everything I'm showing you is written by Roman Catholics. This is not Seventh-day Adventists trying to say something about them. This is what they say in their books very boldly. Look, the church, after changing the day of rest from the Jewish Sabbath of the seventh day of the week to the first, made the third commandment refer to Sunday as the day to be kept holy as the Lord's day. Rome did that. Rome says, we did it. Rome says, hey, Pentecostals, you want to know why you go to church on Sunday? We did it. Hey, Baptists, you want to know why you go to church on Sunday? We did it. Hey, non-denominationals, you want to know why you go to church on Sunday? We did it. Rome says, we are the reason you go. It's not because of the Bible. It's because of us. And watch the bold. This is nothing. Watch the boldness. Converts catechism. Which is the Sabbath day? Their answer. Saturday is the Sabbath day. Why do we observe Sunday instead of the Sabbath? Notice the answer. Because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. They make it clear. They said, we did it. We did it. Going on. Sunday is a Catholic institution, and its claims to observance can be defended only on Catholic principles. They say, they're saying, you Protestants, you can try to quote the Bible all you want. The only way you can defend Sunday observance is on Catholic principles. Then they went even further. Watch this one. From the beginning to end of Scripture, there is not a single passage that warrants the transfer of weekly public worship from the last day of the week to the first. Not a single passage. Then they said, reason and sense demand. Look at, look at the challenge that Rome puts out to all of the so-called Protestants. Look at what it says. It says, reason and sense demand the acceptance of one or the other of these alternatives. Either Protestantism and the keeping holy of Saturday or Catholicity and the keeping holy of Sunday. Compromise is impossible. They make it clear. If you're a Protestant, you should be keeping Sabbath. The only people who should be keeping Sunday is Roman Catholic. That's what they're telling you. Going on. Here's a bold statement. I hope you're ready for this. I thought that this was a bold statement. The Protestant claiming the Bible to be the only guide of faith has no warrant for observing Sunday. In this matter, the Seventh-day Adventist is the only consistent Protestant. Rome said that. That's why I put the reference right there. The question box, the Catholic Universe Bulletin, August 14th, 1942. Rome literally said that. They said, the Protestant claiming the Bible to be the only God of faith has no warrant for observing Sunday. In this matter, the Seventh-day Adventist is the only consistent Protestant. That was their statement. Continuing, people who think that the Scriptures should be the sole authority should logically become Seventh-day Adventists and keep Saturday holy. St. Catherine Catholic Church Sentinel, May 21st, 1995. Rome said that. But if not, any of these... How about this one? What does the papacy say is her symbol or mark of authority? Notice the following section from a Catholic catechism. Question. Have you any other way of proving that the church has power 
to institute festivals of precepts? Answer, had she not such power, she could not have done that in which all modern religionists agree with her. She could not have substituted the observance of Sunday, the first day of the week, for the observance of Saturday, the seventh day, a change for which there is no scriptural authority. Rome literally bases their spiritual authority on the fact that they have made basically the whole religious world keep Sunday. That's how strong it is. And if all of this wasn't enough, I think this is the strongest statement that I've seen come from Rome. Somebody goes to Rome and says, but Rome, don't you understand that the Bible teaches to keep Sabbath, the seventh day, not the first day? You know what Rome's answer is? Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible. And this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. My brothers and sisters, that's blasphemy. That is blasphemy. The mark of the beast is the enforcement of Sunday observance. To actually tell the world, God gave us his word, but we're above it. What kind of blasphemy is this, my brothers and sisters? And I'm not here going after any particular Catholic individual. I know plenty of Catholic individuals. I have relatives. My mother-in-law, who is a wonderful woman, whom I love dearly, she's a Catholic woman. There's many wonderful Catholic people, but the Catholic Church's system of worship and ideology, that thing, my brothers and sisters, is blasphemous to the Word of God. What church can say we're above the Bible? Once you're above the Bible, who holds you accountable? No one. But yet this is what a lot of people are doing. Sunday is a Catholic institution. Sabbath is God's institution. And God's going to have a last people in the last days that he's going to mark. He's going to mark those who have chosen to keep his covenant and go against the tide of what the rest of the world is doing. You know, my brothers and sisters, it was when I understood this, it was with great pleasure that I took a stand for Jesus. I went back to my pastors, and I asked my pastors, I said, I said are you aware of this? Yes, we know. I said, what are you going to do about it? Well, you know. And they gave excuses. Is that what you're going to do? Are you going to give excuses? There are some of us in this room that we have been observing man-made commandments, thinking we're pleasing God. And in our times of ignorance, God winked at it. But now, God commands all men everywhere to repent. And so it is that I'm going to ask a question. And this time, we're not doing it with the cards just yet. My question is this. There are some of us in this room that Sunday observance and attending church and all these things is part of our practice. And here it is, we're learning this incredibly startling information. And there are some of us that are hearing this, and we're saying, Lord, I did not know this. I did not know this. And you know what God says? God says, I love you. God says, that's why I've been sparing your life up until this point, so you could have the breath of life in you still, so you could hear this. Because God says, I'm getting ready to make up my jewels. And God says, and I want you to be one of my jewels. But God says, but my jewels cannot be those who choose to persist in sin. God says, my jewels are going to be the ones who follow me, the ones who do what I say, the ones who understand that though you might think the world protects you, the world never protected you. God was the one that always protected you. Every time that car almost came and hit you and it didn't hit you, that was God. Every time we were smoking and drinking and drugging and all that other stuff and we're still alive today with sound minds, that was God. All of us who have gone through all those things of life where there was a gun that went off and the bullet could have hit us and we didn't get hit, that was God. Every single event you can think of in your life where you know I'm not supposed to be here. I know I'm not supposed to be here. Sawed off shotgun. Boom. Shot right at me. Didn't get hit. That was God. That man who came by, shot his 9mm pistol. Bullet passes my ear. Didn't hit me. That was God. That walking across the street, that bus going full speed, hitting me dead on in the front. That was God. God knew this hard-headed boy. That's rebelling against me. God said, one day he will be my servant. God knew it. And I'm just so thankful. Now, my brothers and sisters, I'm giving you a piece of my story. You have your story. 
you have your story. And there are people in your life that I can't reach. And many other preachers can't reach. But you can. And so what God is saying is, it's time to tell your story. But you got to follow him. And so I'm going to ask you a question, very important question. If you understood this study today, and you are saying, Lord, by your grace, it's not about tradition. It's not even about what I feel and what I think. By your grace, I'm going to do what you say because I can see that you gave everything for me. And by your grace, I give everything to you. If that is your decision, I'm inviting you to stand to your feet with me. I'm inviting you to stand to your feet. And don't get up if you know that's not your decision, brothers and sisters, because God don't like lies. You're getting up because you're saying, that's it, Lord. I'm keeping your command. I got to do what you say. Doesn't matter what mother does. Doesn't matter what father does. Doesn't matter what girlfriend, boyfriend, husband, wife. It does not matter. I'm going to do what God says and God alone. You will find that God will bless you. You have blessings in store that are deeper than you know. And so it is, my brothers and sisters. There's going to be a little handout for everybody as you leave. Make sure you get that handout. It's going to be right out there at the door. All of our visitors, God bless you. Thank you so much for coming. And when you get that handout, you study. Give us your cards. If any of you did, if you did not get to fill out a card, give us your card. Put your name on there. Put your number. Put whatever way we can contact you so that way, by God's grace, we can help you understand more of these blessed truths. And I believe the Lord is going to do wondrous things in your life. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's all pray together. Our loving Father, Lord, we praise you and thank you for the truth as it is in Jesus. Lord, we praise you because you have revealed to us truly wondrous things out of your law. And Father, we accept the truths that have been taught today. And Lord, it's our desire to be counted amongst the faithful servants that will receive your mark as the winds are preparing to blow. It's not our desire to follow tradition. It's our desire to follow the Lamb whithersoever he goes. And so keep us faithful to the commitments that we have made today. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.